All right, let's go over to Luke chapter number one, and let's continue uh, our, our, our study here that we're doing. Um, and we're, I, I named this the birth of John the Baptist foretold, uh, because we're going to see, uh, you know, uh, Gabriel's instructions here to Zacharias, but not today. <laughs> we'll get into that. Last week, we, uh, we uh, introduced it by verses one through four. And of course, this goes right along with what we've been looking at with uh, Elizabeth and Mary, and they're praising God. And actually, they're, they are uh, uh, prophecies, is, is what they are, all right, as we look at that. And that, that's what I'm actually interested in here. But as I began studying this about uh, the angel of Zechariah, Zacharias, there's so much information here that I thought was interesting. I thought I better better give it to you folks because nobody's really in a hurry here. But let me read verses five through six, okay? Five and six. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Excuse me a minute. I put someone else in here. Okay. So we're in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Now, in the study of the verses all the way down from 5 to 25 here, you're going to find four personalities. Uh, first is Herod, king of the king of the Jews. Here, as we see in verse number one, then Zacharias, who was a priest and the husband of Elizabeth, who is the third person, and uh, of course she was uh, a barren uh, woman. She didn't have any children, if you remember that. And then Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, is going to be mentioned. Now, what we find is is Herod's mentioned once, and Gabriel's mentioned once. Whereas Zacharias five times and Elizabeth four times in a chapter. And I found it interesting that Gabriel, I had to look this up, uh, he's found twice in Luke, uh, once here with Zacharias and once with Mary, right? But two times he's found back in the book of Daniel, in the, in the prophecy there, dealing with, with Daniel. So I thought that was interesting. But let's start here in verse five in the days of Herod, king of Judea. So let's talk about Herod here for just a little while, however long it takes, all right? Now, uh, Herod was born in 73 BC, and he died in 4 BC, okay, 4 BC. So you can figure that out. He ended up being, what, about 69 years old. Uh, he was king from 37 BC until 4 BC, till, till his death. And he actually ruled over Judea, Samaria, and Galilee at any given time during his, his what, what people call his kingship, okay? But he became king because of his connection with Rome, his political connection. Because the Romans didn't crown people as kings. They had governors and that sort of thing. But he, he, was, he was a big deal. So he was appointed by Rome. And he was even given an army. Now, the army was to help him to keep peace in the area there, right? And oftentimes, he used it to bring other portions, uh, especially east of the Jordan River, into his kingdom, if you want to call it that, it is what he did, all right? But his father was an Edomite. And, of course, an Edomite, as you read the scripture, come from Esau. So as you, you read about this, you're going to find some things about Herod that are very, very iffy, if you please. All right. Now, what happened was this, that Herod's father converted to Judaism. And he did that for political reasons, right? Political reasons to stay close to Rome. And because Rome was using... Uh, Jerusalem and Judea as a trade route, and so it was financially positive for Rome uh, to have a Jew in charge, all right, and that was that was uh, Herod's father as it began. So what ha happened with Herod, he practiced Judaism, 
to further his own political gains also, okay? Now, here's what's, it, it gets, start getting dicey. Mr. Bullinger's, uh, if you have a companion Bible, back to Appendix 109, he has a list of the family tree there uh, of Herod. And he shows four wives, okay, four wives. But when I went online, and, and uh, Wikipedia is not in business evidently anymore for a while, where they're uh, taking a break or something, but uh, uh, Britannica, Cyclopedia Britannica, show that he had nine wives during the course of his life, all right? Which, which I thought was, I mean, that's a lot for anybody, right? Nine wives with children. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. Now, let's look at this so we can get back into the scripture. He had a son named Herod Philip I that you find in Matthew 14, 3. If you're taking notes, I'm, I'm not going to turn there. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 17. And since we're in Luke, come over to chapter 3 with me, please. Luke chapter 3 and verse number 19. It says this, but when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him, this is by John the Baptist, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. So that, in chapter 3, that's not Herod the Great that you see in chapter 1. That's one of his sons, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. There's also a Herod... Antipas, A-N-T-I-P-A-S, uh, found in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 19. He's a brother to Herod Philip, okay? And he's also found in Luke 13 and Luke 23. Now, he was also married to uh, Herodias. And you remember why John was locked up? If you, if you remember the story there, is because... He went after his brother's wife and wanted him or her for himself. And that happened. And John rebuked him for that. And John ended up ultimately being beheaded uh, because of that. All right. So that's what we see. Now, in Mr. Bullinger's list of four, four names, the fourth one he has is Cleopatra. Now, I didn't find that in the Cyclopedia Britannica, okay, as one. But Cleopatra was very close to the situation there in, uh, if you just want to call it Palestine, okay, in, in that area, because she was given land as the head of the, the Egyptian state by Mark Anthony. And most of us know the, the story about Anthony and Cleopatra, right? I hope, hope you do, at any rate. But she was given much of the land there, so there was a connection between her and uh, Herod. Now, whether she was a wife or not, that I, I can't say, okay? Now, here's, here's where it gets really dicey. Herod had a, uh, I want to say the name correctly, Mary Me. Is that right, Susan? No, she's out in the kitchen. <laughs> anyway, it's M-A-R-I-M-I-A-M-E, all right? And she was his third wife. In fact, he had two wives with that name. Now, when it came to his third wife, her, her grandfather, her mother, and her brother, and the two sons that she had, were all connected with the government of Herod. In fact, her brother, I, don't, I didn't write his name down, he became, Herod appointed him as a high priest. Uh, because his wife was of Jewish origin, okay? And uh, he was so popular among the populace that Herod was jealous of him. So he concocted a scheme in which to kill her, uh, the brother, okay, of his, of his wife. And what happened is they had a, uh, believe it or not, they had a, they had a swimming party the Jordan River. Now, this is fact here, okay? Even Josephus mentions this in his writings. And what happened, they, they, had, they had the party, and they were out swimming. And what Herod did, he had paid four 
men to drown his brother-in-law and make it look like an accident. And that's what he did. But it didn't end there. Because once that happened, her grandfather started wondering about this, started investigating what's going on. So Herod had him killed. Then he had her two sons killed. Then he accused his wife of having an affair with somebody else. They went to the Jewish court and they put her to death. So he, he was quite a character is, is what I'm saying here. All right. As far as family situations are concerned. But he was a great builder of cities, Caesarea over on the Mediterranean, and the number, I think there's five cities that he had built. Uh, and he did it for the politics of it. But he also built temples throughout the area for the Gentiles in order that they might worship their gods, all right? That doesn't seem to be right for a man that's, you know, running Jerusalem and, and uh, that sort of thing. He even rebuilt started to rebuild. Now, he died before the, the finish of it, the second temple. Now, uh, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you, you'll find out Zerubbabel built that temple, then uh, uh, Nehemiah put the walls around, okay, Jerusalem. This is after the Babylonian captivity. And, and then when Ezra came down, he brought the spiritual end of it uh, by reading the scriptures and et cetera, et cetera, to try to get things going again there, okay? But uh, when Herod rebuilt that, he made it beautiful because the Jews didn't have a whole lot of money, even though the, uh, um, it's not Cyrus, whoever the king was that sent him back down, uh, he paid for a lot of the rebuilding, okay, of, of the temple, but it was very basic. So when Herod took office there, he had the temple rebuilt. Now, do this one. They come back to Matthew, if, if you would. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Come back to John chapter 2. Okay, John chapter 2 is where we want to go. All right. John chapter number 2. And let's notice verse number 20. Verse number 20, if you would. <clears throat> and actually, we can be, begin in 19. Jesus answered them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, I took, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Of course, the next verse tells us he was speaking of his body. But we get a time frame here. The Lord is 30 years old at this point in time. So when he came into the world, the temple was 16 years into being built. And then Herod dies just a, couple, a few years after that. OK, so he never saw the completion of the temple, if you please. Now, I, I think there are some things you you should understand about this. All right. Because during the, the, the 300, 400 year si period of silence, right, from Malachi to to Matthew. Uh, the Jews, how do we say this? The Jewish priests and the, the uh, hierarchy. All right. They were no better after Nehemiah and Ezra left the scene than their predecessors were and the reasons for going in, into captivity. In fact, there were years where the temple was the temple of Zeus. Now, this is history, all right? Temple of Zeus. And, of course, God himself, if we say Yahweh, he never entered that temple. Okay, I don't know if you know that or not. But he never entered that temple at all, okay? It, it was there for decoration, and, I mean, people worshiped God there, the, those that loved God, but there was no indication that God God was ever there or uh, li lived in a temple, okay, as, as you see that. And so what happens then is this. So we come back to chapter number one. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, I'd like to read you uh, two sentences here from G. Campbell Morgan. Some of you might have heard of him, but uh, he read, he, he says this in his uh, Luke commentary. We have read it all our lives, speaking about the days of Herod and reading it easily and regularly and persistently, we know what it means. Know what what means? The days of Herod. 
but let us stop and think of its real significance of the dark, sinister, and terrible conditions of things that are suggested by the days of Herod. It was a horrible, horrible time in the life of Israel. Even though they had come back, you know, from captivity, rebuilt the temple, but they go 400 years of silence from God until this uh, business of John the Baptist begins, all right, uh, before the Lord shows up. So it was not a good time for Israel, spiritually speaking, all right, spiritually speaking. Uh, watch this. Come on. Uh, keep your hand here, but come back to Galatians with me, please. And chapter number four, if you would. Galatians four. I believe that's what I want. Okay. Galatians four. And let's notice verse number four. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So when did the Lord come to this earth? John 1, verse 14. Was during the reign of whom? Herod the Great. And what did we just read about G. Campbell Morgan? Dark, sinister, terrible conditions of things. That's when God sent his son to the earth to redeem those that were under the law. I mean, things were, were bad, all right? It was a bad time there in Israel. Herod was an individual, Herod the Great, who was jealous of everybody. I mean, if a man had nine wives, what did he do with them all? See? In fact, the, the, the girl I told you about, uh, marry me, all right? How do you say it? Mary Om. Um. Mary Om. Um. Okay, I'm sorry, Susan corrected me there all right after he killed her he married another girl and renamed her after his first the other wife so he, he was a character to say the least all right he was a real character as you look at this now uh when we do go back to matthew chapter two all right and we'll be back to luke here in just a second but come back to matthew chapter two all right, now we remember this, but verse 16 here says, Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. What did Jeremiah say? A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they, they were no more. That's the situation. But in verse 19, but when Herod died, and that's when the Lord, Mary, and Joseph, and Jesus come back into the land okay when after that happened so things weren't good is, is what I'm, I'm trying to say here okay things weren't good so let's come on back and keep moving here if we can all right and verse number five of luke chapter one in the days of herod king of judah there was a priest named zacharias of the division of abijah all right of the division of abijah now the word Zacharias, the name, means this, remembered by Jehovah. Now, there's about 30 uh, Zacharias in the Bible, mostly Old, Old Testament, okay? But this Zachariah was a priest married to Elizabeth, okay? And he was of the, of the division of Abijah. Now, Here's what happens with the, you know, you say, well, what, what's the uh, divisions of Abijah, of, of the priesthood here? Uh, Aaron, the first of the priests, you know, um, Moses' brother, had four sons. The oldest two, Nadab and Abihu, were struck down because they offered strange fire in the tabernacle. You can read about that in Leviticus 10. 
But his two other sons, okay, Eleazar and Ithamar, okay, they then fathered the priesthood, as you read about in the Old Testament. And Ithamar fathered eight families that ended up being priests. And Eleazar, it's 16 families, right? Now, this all happened, uh, and they were numbered in the days of David, all right? The days of David, and I'll give you a scripture here in a second. But here's what happened. Remember, David wanted to build a temple, but he had the, the tabernacle brought him, but he wasn't allowed to build a temple, prepared it so Solomon can do it. But so what David did, he distributed by lot the order of their service, these priests. So he had 24 families of, of the priesthood here, all right? And so what they determined was this, that the 24 families would serve twice a year, eight days, twice a year. Except when there was a feast day and then all the priests would be, almost all the priests would be there. There was over 20,000 of them. Okay, so that's a lot of, a lot of priests there as, as you see this. So what happened is this, after the Babylonian captivity, the priests were taken out to Babylon. Okay, and only four of the 24 returned down to Jerusalem and Judea. Now, remember, we're talking about a 70 year period here. And I don't know if you've read, if you get a chance, and you know, this winter when it's nice and snowy, <laughs> read Ezra and Nehemiah, because it wasn't a whole lot of people that returned percentage wise back to Judea, okay? And it, it, as you see it, so, so it's interesting. But what we find is this, that even though there are only four families or four courses, if you wanna call them that, okay, returns, their names were Jedidiah, Emir, Pashir, and Harim, H-A-R-I-M. You can find that in Ezra chapter number two. So what the Jews did is they took those four courses of priests and divided them back up into 24 courses as, they, as David had done, okay? As David had done. And they, what they did is gave them the original names that David had given them. So they, it was like starting with a clean slate, okay? And uh, you can read about that also in Ezra and, and Nehemiah, all right? So that's where he was from. Uh, and... He, he was right from the family of Aaron, if you please, okay? Now, we have then, in verse number five, okay, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. So Elizabeth came right from Aaron. So she was in the Levite family, if you please, all right? The Levite family. Now, Elizabeth's name is this. My God is an oath, O-A-T-H. My God is an oath or the absolute reliable one. So that's how they proceed. You know, and they named the young lady Elizabeth. It was after God, the absolute reliable one. She was a daughter of the daughters of Aaron, okay? Um, and I am going to read this. I'm going to go back to... Uh, Leviticus chapter 21. Okay, Leviticus 21. Here we are, 25, 23. All right, 21 and verses 13 and 14 is what I want. And it says this, it's speaking about the priests now, all right? Uh, the heading on a chapter is regulations concerning priests. Verse, verse 13 says, he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, or one who is profaned by holotry. These he may not take, but rather he is to marry a virgin of his own people. His own people then would be the Levites. So that was the perfect thing to do. And that's what happened with Zechariah and Elizabeth here. Now, again, if you read uh, Nehemiah and, and Ezra, you're going to find that in the last chapters of, of Nehemiah there, that 
the priests were all brought in. And if they had women who were not of the Levite or even Jewish, they had to get rid of their wives and their children. I don't know how that worked. You know, it, it sounds kind of cruel. It seems to me you just wouldn't allow them to be priests anymore. But but that's what happened. OK, so and, and it happened because of the of the captivity. All right. As, as you see, see that. So she was compatible totally uh, with Zacharias. And uh, we're going to read um, in verse seven of Luke chapter one. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. So they were old folks here. OK, old folks. But I say they were compatible because of this in chapter one, verse 60 of Luke, okay, of Luke, and uh, when John was born, remember the angel said his name would be John, and we'll see that next week as, as we look at that, okay, uh, they, the folks there wanted to name him Zacharias after his father, but his mother answered and said, no, indeed, but he shall be called John, right, so her husband had relayed that to her, uh, however he did, because he couldn't speak, okay? And then in 63, it says, and he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, his name is John, and they were all astonished. So they were they were in agreement, and they been, they were elderly, been together a long time, which, which is always a good sign here, okay, for their, for their relationship, if, if you please. But when we get to uh, verse six, they were both righteous, in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Okay, walking blamelessly. Now, what do you think when you hear that? Walking blamelessly. Anybody have an opinion on that? All right, now Susan's right here and she says they... They were walking under the old covenant system, okay, of laws and, and uh, requirements of, of the Lord. But I think it goes further than that, yeah. as you see this. They were walking blamelessly, and they were righteous in the sight of whom? God. God. Okay, righteous. Walking, thank it says. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, do this. Come over to Ephesians. Let's just spend a few minutes here, okay? Uh, Ephesians, please. Let's go to chapter 4 in Ephesians. All right. <clears throat> now, in Ephesians chapter number 4, notice verse 1. Therefore, I... Now, this is Paul, right? The prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now, he's talking to people here that have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? We, we call them saints. You see it verses or chapters one through three. They, they've done that. So that means that they were righteous in terms of what they receive from Jesus Christ. But Paul is imploring them to walk in a manner worthy of who they are. Okay? Walk worthy. And what were they? Well, they were saints of God who received the righteousness from Christ. Now, let's go over to Colossians chapter number one. Please. Colossians chapter number one. And notice with me verse 10. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's, let's start in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it. Now, remember, Paul had never been to Colossae. Okay. Epaphras is who gave him the information about these dear people. So it says there, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, 
to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, just flip over to chapter 2 and notice verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so do what? Walk in him. Okay? Walk in him as, as, as you see this. So what's he talking about? Well, one, go to the next book of the Bible. <laughs> First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's notice verses 11 and 12. Just as you know how we were exhorting, exhorting and encouraging and imploring, one of Paul's favorite words, each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, he's called, Ephesians, we, we read that. They are to walk worthy of their calling. We go back to Colossians 1 again. Do, do that with me, please, in verse number 10, okay? Where he says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. They're already saints. To please him in all respects. So they're saints. Paul wants them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord so they can please him in all respects. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I think there's a practical lesson to find from Zacharias and Elizabeth. It wasn't that they were keeping the law. It was part of them. It was in them. In their relationship with God. I don't think they had to get up in the morning and read the Ten Commandments and all the regulations that the priests had to go through. Not at all. As you see this, they were close to God in relationship. And that's what God wants from every believer. Okay. Every believer. Uh, now, <laughs> Tim gave me a book. The name of it was uh, Eternal Life, you know, online. So I went Henry Drummond. I read something by him years ago. But he, he gives a new slant on what eternal life is. Now, I only read it once, and I'm, I'm going to read it again to make sure it's, it, it's really settled in there. But Mr. Drummond talks about correspondence with God. Because there's two, two how would we say it? He uses the term environments that you and I can walk in. There's the environment of this world, and there's the environment of God. And here's the wonder of it. Paul's asking these saints, who I think Zacharias and Elizabeth are perfect examples of it, to walk in the environment of God. Now, why would that be? And this is what I, Tim, this is what I got mainly out of the book. God's environment never changes. It's holy. It's righteous. It's not up and down like this. And in Luke 1, Herod the king, what did Mr. Campbell write about? It was dark. It was depressing. It was a miserable time to be on earth. Why? Because the environment of the world was doing this. Up and down, up and down. And what happens to people when their minds get attached to the environment of the world? How do their lives go? Up and down, up and down. You get miserable, you know, depending on what you hear, the kind of news, that sort of thing. But as you as you look, and the thing I pulled out of the, you know, the, the, the book was only 46 pages, was that God's environment, folks, never changes. And so Paul's saying to these folks, walk worthy of of your call because what's your call according to Thessalonians it's the kingdom of God now it's surprising to me how many Christians still don't believe that the kingdom of God is here it's within us because they want to see something 
They want to see a kingdom. They want to see Jesus Christ on the throne. They want to see what's going to happen over there, you know, and, and more Jews killed and all that sort of thing, which is sad. The kingdom of God is without observation. Christ is where? He is in us. Okay. Now, I was thinking of this because of, of uh, Sunday when the, the Ruse were with us. I had a nice time listening to them. But we had, we had a group of folks. We went in the back uh, with questions uh, about what was going on. And, uh, you know, they brought their books so they could look and, and see. And the biggest one, the problem that they had is because the earth is going to be destroyed. And... I said, you have to begin thinking how, like the Jews think, okay? And what was what was the earth, what was, uh, you, you know, the, the temple, or, or the heaven, rather, uh, to the Jews? Well, it was a temple and the land around it and that sort of thing. And, and as you see that, I told, told the fellows, you have to relax about this. Because we're moved into a spiritual realm and not a physical realm, okay? But you say in Revelation, now let's see if I can say this simply. In Revelation, John got to measure the new Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of thoughts on that. Either it's all of us, all the people, or it is a literal city that's a spiritual city. Uh, Bill Petrie believes it's right above the earth right now. Dennis Coyle, you know, it can't be seen because it's spiritual. Our brother Dennis Coyle, if you remember Brother Denny, uh, he, he thinks it was right here on in another dimension right on the earth. And that's where the, the, the saints are, okay? So there's a lot of things to think about this. But the main thing to get out of this is the spirituality. God's environment is spiritual. And you and I have the opportunity to live in a spiritual realm while we're walking on the face of the earth. Now, we know it's necessary to, to work Raise your kids, grandchildren, all that sort of thing, right? But how do you do it? You do it in the realm of God. As Paul says, you walk worthy in that realm and not the realm of the world. Because the realm of the world will never be stable. Never. Okay? Which is too bad. But that's that's how life is. All right? So as we look then at... at uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were righteous. I believe they were righteous because they had them in their hearts. And they were serious about that thing, about God and how they, they lived in relationship to him. Uh, they had a correspondence with God. Same level, okay, with God. And, and that's how they lived. So that's something for us to think about, okay, think about. Now, next week, next message, we'll, we'll finish up... Uh, with Zachariah and and the angel, okay, uh, Gabriel here, and uh, one of the commentaries, and I, I have five of them uh, in relationship to Luke. One of the writers said that this is the most comical prophecy that you're going to see in Scripture. And as I read this and thought about it, I could see where he's coming about. And I'll, I'll, share that with you next week okay and and uh we'll, we'll see why he he, he thought that it, it's 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 very interesting as you go through that okay uh one thing to do read read if you would uh let me get back here luke chapter one and uh you know start in verse seven go all the way down through verse 25 and and notice what's going on there Okay, notice what's going on. But mainly, I'm going to ask you this question about this. They prayed or had a petition that they asked God for a child. And Gabriel's going to say that. But it says a petition. How many is a, how many is a petition? Is that continually asking every day? Or is it just a one-time prayer and request? And I think from, from this chapter, you can learn about a lot about prayer life. 
there's a lot of things we pray about over and over and over again. And I, you know, I, I learned this from Brother Scott years ago. Why do you keep praying? You don't think God heard you? Or God doesn't remember? Okay. Problem is we don't remember. <laughs> is, is what the problem is. So back to the original thought. Okay. Herod was a rascal. It was during his reign that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh, of course, just as a child, okay? But Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous, okay? Walking the way God wanted them. They were righteous in God's sight, which is interesting because you don't learn about righteousness for believers until Paul writes Romans and keeps going, okay? But they were righteous in the sight of God, which is a great encouragement to me as, as i read that about them so i'm going to close there uh about this 20 till but anybody have anything you'd like to add or subtract There's a lot of history here I, I i can say this to you um i've had a set of books for 30 years from a gentleman named heckerson and uh <clears throat> takes up a lot of room on my my bookshelf and I really like it because a lot of practical stuff, a lot of history. And when you get to uh, Matthew chapter number two about Herod and the children, he writes five pages of history about Herod. And I couldn't read that to you because you'd fall asleep or whatever. Okay. But, uh, but <clears throat> if you bring a pizza over some night, we'll sit and have a pizza and I'll read the five chapters to you or five pages. I mean, it's it's totally interesting to see how evil this man was, okay? But the Bible and God's grace kind of passes over that, except for the children part there.